you will, go ahead and open your Bibles to the third chapter of the book of Galatians. Everybody say Galatians chapter 3. Hallelujah. You know, we're, we're, we're here on Resurrection Day. We're celebrating the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We celebrate what that means to us as individuals because it's more than just a, a high holy day in the church. It's more than a, a day to go get new shirts and ties and Easter dresses and all that's kind of cool. You know, to go out and take your little family pictures. We do that. We do that. We're going to go on home this afternoon. And our neighbor has a real, has a cherry tree. It's not a Yoshino. It's a different kind. And it blooms real late. So they got nice, pretty pink flowers all over it. So we're going to go stand in front of it and take our picture. We do that every year. All those things, if I not have an Easter ham, hallelujah, right here in the kitchen, right now after church, that's what we're having. Glory to God. Amen. I mean, we can start preaching on the food. You know, but th th we celebrate this day. Uh, and, and it has great, if not the greatest, significance uh, to the church of any day or date in history. Uh, we, we preach at Christmas that the child grew up. You know, the, the birth of Jesus has no meaning without the resurrection of Jesus. If Jesus did not die for our sin and was raised from the dead by the Father, by the power of God and the glory of God, then Christmas would have no meaning. Because the child in the manger didn't do anything, he didn't do anything for you. That was his entrance. That was him coming into the earth. That was the, the beginning of a journey that would cause him to become sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. It was his death, his burial, the judgment of God, his, his resurrection and his ascension and seating at the right hand of the Father that has meaning and makes Christmas of significance and makes life of significance for everyone who believes in him. Glory to God. Amen. <clears throat> and so... Uh, you know, we, we, we'll run over. let's run back real quick to Luke 24 before I run over to Galatians chapter uh, 3. Verse 1, now you know you've heard this before. I was reading a, um, a, a book recently, a religion book, where and, and on the subject of Judaism that the writer said there's no credible evidence of the, uh, that the Exodus account took place as it did. Uh, there's only one mention of the Jews, but, you know, uh, and of course they use the term now BCE and CE. I don't, I don't accept those terms. You know, BCE, before current era, CE, current era. Uh, of course, they, the current era and the before current era all hinge on the data and the birth of Jesus Christ. You know, I mean, you know, listen, you, the seculars can be, you know, warped anyway. Uh, but by 1800 BC, 1800 BC, before Christ, uh, there is record in the Egyptian that they had annihilated the Israelis. Of course, they have it. They're still here. And, um, you know, and that's the only record until about 600 years later. Yes, yeah, we had the biblical account thousands of years ago, and they, you know, they try to say that matter. It does matter. I said it does matter. See, now, listen, Bible, the, the Christianity is a, a matter of faith. It is believing in that which you cannot lay hold of and touch. We do not need carbon dating. We don't need, you know, the Shroud of Turin. We don't need, you know, the, the walls of Jericho that did, they found did not get knocked over. They were just pressed down. Uh, you know, God's a good general. Hallelujah. I was watching the Ten Commandments last night, and Pharaoh said, God's not a good general because he put him between the sea and us. No, he's a great general because he's, you know, when, when he gets to a tough place, he just creates a miracle. Amen. He can bring you into the toughest place you could ever face, and he can just work a miracle and get you out of it. Glory to God. I believe in miracles. Can you say amen? amen. Now, upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, there came into the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed, there stood about two men in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, the, the angels said to them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? Or, or the margin says, Him that liveth among the dead. He is not here. He is risen. Remember, remember, I'll tell you, we've we got to go back to Scripture. There's over 3,000 prophecies in the Old Testament, and every one has come true except those in relevance to the second coming of Christ. When you start studying how Jesus was born in Bethlehem, hello, came out of Egypt, came, was a Nazarene, are you here? And then he was, the, the, the 22nd Psalm says, they looked at him whom they pierced, a, a form of cruci the form of crucifixion, 1,500 years before the Romans instituted crucifixion as ex execution. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There's so many things concerning the, the biblical account that it's just, you know, over 66 books, all these authors over 1,600 years or whatever, you know, all lining up and all agreeing and all coming out saying the same thing. Yeah. Hallelujah. 
Now, I know that there are people who try to discount that, but they, they have an agenda to discount it. And you can prove anything you want to prove if you want to discount something. But uh, historical evidence, even Josephus talked about, you know, the, a secularist talked about the, the, the stories of, of the risen Jew, you know, and all those kind of things. So, hallelujah. Remember, remember he says, remember, glory to God. Hallelujah. Um, how he spake unto you while he was in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Remember, he said, he said Destroy this temple, and, on the third, and I'll raise it up again. So they thought he meant the temple of Jerusalem. He's talking about his body. Glory to God. Hallelujah. And they remembered his words and returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven. Hallelujah. And they go on, you know, and of course then Jesus appears to them. And so we have Jesus resurrected from the dead. Now remember um, in one account, a biblical account, we have four. We have the, the three synoptic gospels and then we have John. Uh, the synoptic gospels being those who are synonymous and speaking, the, you know, uh, very parallel stories. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Then John's account will have different stories and so forth and different accounts of things. <clears throat> um, uh, how that when Jesus, when, when they came to the sepulcher, Mary saw the gardener, who she thought was the gardener, and went up. And, and, of course, the King James says, touch me not, but the Greek says, clutch me not, for I have not yet ascended to your Father, and to my Father, and to your God, and to my God. But go tell, he said, go tell the disciples and Peter. Go tell Peter. Hallelujah. See, God was thinking about Peter. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful? The one who denied him three times. He said, go tell him I'm alive. Hallelujah. Go tell him I've risen up. Hallelujah. <clears throat> and then he appeared to them later. There, there are so many things that took place between the time Jesus died and the time he was raised from the dead. That, that short period where he became sin for us. And God judged our sin. And then God raised him from the dead. And then he came and he, he appeared to the disciples. And then on the, on the day of Pentecost, he, he ascended into heaven to sit down at the right hand of the Father. And um, where he ever lives, the Bible says, to make intercession for us. Hallelujah. The church was birthed. And they came out of the upper room. Remember the day of Pentecost, the, the, the Holy Ghost came. They all came out of the upper room and um, you know, filled with the Holy Spirit. And there's so many things that happen. But I want to talk today about what redemption is all about. And we, 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 uh, I, I had planned on preaching something different. And I just couldn't get settled all night long. I couldn't get settled. I got up this morning and I wasn't settled. And so it's not, I'm not changing on the fly right now here. I, was, I just couldn't. I wrestled. I wrestled. And I wrestled. All, I, actually, all day yesterday. I was going to preach what happened from the cross to the throne. I wanted to preach that. And, you know, I can preach it. Hallelujah. You know, it's, it's a good preaching sermon. It's just, and it's got good stuff in it. But I just couldn't get settled to stay with that. <clears throat> so this morning we're going to talk about redemption. Being redeemed from spiritual death, poverty, and sickness. Galatians, the third chapter, in the 13th verse says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it's written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Now, if you'll go back and study uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 15, through the end of the chapter, you get a pretty good picture of the curse of the law. Cursed in the city and cursed in the field. Cursed when you come in. Cursed when you go out. Cursed when you lie down. Cursed when you get up. Cursed in your cattle. And in other words, that is the curse of the law. When you disobey God's commandments and you walk according to the, 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 this world, you had a curse on you. Why? The world system is cursed. When Adam fell in the Garden of Eden, said, he said, you'll live by the sweat of your brow. You know, and so it wasn't that way before. When in the garden before the fall, there was you didn't have to plow, you didn't have to work. It all just it was just there. But man sinned, man rebelled, man went against God's plan. Adam committed high treason, and a curse came on him. He was driven from the garden, so he could not eat the tree of the fruit, uh, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Well, actually, he couldn't eat the tree of, of life because if he ate the tree of life, he would have been stuck in that spiritual state forever. See, he, became, he, got, he knew what evil was once he ate the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. He died spiritually, separated from God. Jesus, the word says, Jesus redeemed us. Christ has redeemed us. To redeem means to buy back, to purchase, to ransom, um, to buy up for oneself. Glory to God. Three things happened at the fall of Adam. Man died spiritually. Ultimately, man died physically. And a, per, a curse of poverty came on humanity. How many, of you ever, how many of you ever planted a garden? Four of you planted a garden. Anybody in this room ever planted a garden? Okay, miss. Who's never planted a garden? Gina, Rashawn, Danine. I thought you were a country girl. No, all right. Cap, all right. How many have found out that if you plant a garden, it doesn't take any effort to grow the weeds? 
Have you noticed that? You can plow it up. You can put fertilizer on it. You can put all your little seeds in there. And if you don't watch it constantly, you'll get big old honking weeds in that baby. I planted one behind my house one year, and we, put, we had put uh, cabbage, and we had put tomatoes. We had put green beans out there. We were going to have us a garden. Because we like fresh vegetables out of the garden, you know, and stuff. And I looked out there one day, I'd gotten busy and forgot. I looked out there, and there was a weed this tall, about that big around. I went out there and tried to pull it up. I mean, it's like it took half the garden up with it. I'm, you know why? Because the world system is cursed. Now, what I should have done is gone and prayed over my garden, which I, I, I didn't do, but I should have. You know, no weeds going to grow in my garden. But you, you got, you've got to take, you got to tend your garden to keep the weeds out. It's amazing how the, after the fall of man, you know, the, the, the bad things happen. You know, the, the animal kingdom got messed up. Man got messed up. Started killing folk and all that kind of stuff. That did not happen before. Man was not a murderous being, you know. And so when, when man, in the garden, when man committed high treason, and we're not going to go through the whole, you know, uh, Genesis 2 thing. Go there. I'm trying, I got so much to cover in such a short amount of time. Um, who, who has reservations anywhere? Okay. That's all I need to know. <laughs> Since you don't have reservations, go away. I'm loose. <laughs> Your hamburger's going to burn. Your ham. Laura, let his ham not burn. All right. We have here in Genesis chapter 2. Verse, verse 15, it says, And the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of the tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it, for in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Now, if you read King James and you kind of don't do any study, you'll go, Well, he ate it and he didn't die, because you know, he's supposed to bite it. And, well, the literal Hebrew says, In dying you shall die. Now, if you only see man as a human body, if you only see us as flesh beings, that makes no sense. But according to 2 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, Paul, Paul said, I pray your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of the Lord. Now, that is pneuma, suke, and um, I forget the, the Greek word for body, but it's, it's not carne, it's something else. Huh? Carne, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Nathan. It, it, but the Greek word, so the pneuma is the spirit of man, the suke is the soul of man, and then the Greek word for body, I always forget it, and um, I need to just write it down in my Bible. We are a spirit. We're spiritual beings. We know that Lazarus, when he lifted up his eyes, I mean, when he was in uh, the, the rich man and Lazarus, the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell, but his body wasn't in hell. Saw Lazarus to fall from Abraham's bosom. His, uh, the, 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 the beggar who sat at his table, I mean, sat at his feet and, and just ate the crumbs that fell from the master's table, he, did, he was not in his body in Abraham's bosom. His spirit was. Man is a spirit being. You exist with or without your body. Yeah, right. Now, you can't function here in the earth without your body. Right. Your body's your earth suit. Astronauts have got space suits in heaven. You've got to have an earth suit to walk on the earth. See, when people die, we put their body in the ground, but their spirit. Paul said to be absent from the body, is, to the Christian, is to be present with the Lord. So we, our, our spirits are eternal. Well, what happens about our bodies? At the day of the resurrection, we'll get a, we'll get a glorified, immortal, incorruptible body. But not until then. All right? And so Adam died spiritually. Now, to define the word death biblically, we have to you know, understand what it means. Death does not mean cessation of existence. Biblically, the term does not mean to cease to exist. If you die physically, it simply means your spirit leaves your body. Your body cannot, the body without the spirit is dead, the Bible says. And so <clears throat> when, you, when you die physically, we call physical death, when you reach old age, you have a car wreck, so, you know, somebody shoot, you know, some murder, or some, 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 some event that takes place that your body can no longer function, your spirit leaves your body, that is called physical death. You do not cease to exist. You are still an existing spiritual being. Now, at that event, if you're not born again, you go to hell. If you are born again, if you know Jesus Christ, you go to heaven. There is no hangout in between place. Purgatory does not exist except in Kansas. Okay? <laughs> There's Oklahoma. Is it? Yeah, it's, it's, yeah, somewhere in Kansas or Oklahoma is purgatory, a city called purgatory. There's no purgatory in the spirit. 
to be, Paul said for the Christian to be absent from the body to be present with the Lord. We know according to the, the, the story, not the parable, but the story of the rich man and Lazarus, that the rich man lifted up his eyes in hell, in torments. So you go one or two places. Your spirit continues to exist. So at the time that Adam committed high treason, he died spiritually. <clears throat> he was not, a, so what does spiritual mean? It, spiritual death is separation from God. God is life. And when you're not in communion or in fellowship with God, you are spiritually dead. It doesn't mean you don't exist. It means you don't have God's life in you. It's not too heavy. It's not too heavy. See, so the Bible, Bible definition of de death would be separation. To be separated from your body is physical death. To be separated from God is spiritual death. And then the Bible tells us in the book of Revelation that death and hell shall give up its dead and, you know, and they were cast into the lake of fire, which is a second death or eternal death, and that is eternal separation from God. Not a good place to be. Don't want to be there. Trust me. Okay? You don't get to come back and, and, and work it all out later. Well, you know, I made a mistake when I was there the first time. You know, we, we don't, we're, not, we're not talking about reincarnation. You don't get to come back, bring your karma back, and say, you know, and it's a little bit better this time. You get to come back as a different, higher state. and That doesn't happen. You get, you get one shot. When you hear the gospel preach, you need to respond to it. Now, that means, that, you know, the only, oh, I heard it what, 10 years ago. That wasn't your only chance. But as long as you're breathing, but don't, don't go here, away from here without finding Jesus as your Lord. Yeah. Hallelujah. And so he said, in dying, thou shalt die, or, you know, you will spiritually die. And then and it took Adam 900 years for physical death to take over his body. Somebody came along one time trying to be real cute. Well, you know, they, the Jewish calendar was different in those days. They were half as long as they are now. Okay, 450 years later. That's still a long time. You see, people think they're so cute. One guy got it one day and said, you know, the, the crossing of the Red Sea was no big deal. The water was only six inches deep there. Wow! What a miracle! What are you talking about? The whole army, horses and men, drowned in six inches of water. Come on now. Then somebody else came along and said, the, the feeding of the 5,000 with the two loaves and, the, uh, and the, the, the two fishes, or two, two loaves and five fishes was no big uh, miracle. Uh, the loaves were bigger in those days. 5,000 people? Two fish? What was it, Moby Dick and his wife brought in on a tractor trailer? <laughs> People get, you know, oh, there's no big miracle. I think it was a miracle. Hey, can you imagine the size of ovens it would take to take five loaves to feed 5,000 people? They don't even make them that big. Right. Everybody's always trying to do away with the miracle, the miraculous and the supernatural. You know, man is a spiritual being. And when man died, he, he was separated from God. And the only way to fix that was for someone to come and to redeem mankind back from that spiritual state. Yeah. Now, I know in the Philippines, every year they, crucify, they go crucify themselves. Trying, you can't crucify yourself. No, Christ has been redeemed, made us, redeemed us from the curse of law. He was made a curse for us. For it's written, curses everyone that hangeth on a tree. Man died spiritually, was separated from God. At that point in time, his body became what we refer, refer to in, in biblical terms. Remember, the Paul, uh, Paul wrote to the church and said that when Jesus comes back, this mortal shall put on immortality. This corruptible shall put on incorruption. Okay? What was he talking about? The physical body. At the time that Adam died spiritually, his body became a mortal, or we refer to death-doomed body. We know that the human body replenishes every cell in it every seven years with a genetic defect. It ages. Man was created not to die. It was sin that caused the process of physical aging and death to enter in. So at the time that Adam committed high treason, man died spiritually. His body became mortal or death doomed, and then the earth became cursed with a curse that he would have to live by the sweat of his brow. So we have a threefold curse on humanity because of the fall, spiritual death, sickness, and poverty. Jesus came to redeem us from all three. I said Jesus came to redeem us from all three. <coughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. So he, man has a spirit, he has a soul, he lives in a body. It was all a result of, of Adam's disobedience. Remember, remember Jesus said something really interesting in John 8, 44. You probably read this and went, huh? He said to the Pharisees one day, he looked at them and said, You are your father, the devil, John 8, 44, and the lesson of your father you will fulfill. See, we're, we're born because of Adam's sin under the curse of sin. And it takes acceptance by faith of the redemptive work of Jesus Christ to get us out of that state. Remember, Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. And uh, Nicodemus looked at him and said, 
How can a man be born when he is old? Can I enter the second time into my mother's womb? Any woman had a baby said, dear God, I hope not. Okay? You can't be born. He said, no, you don't understand what I'm talking about. He said, that which is physical, now I'm paraphrasing a little bit from, from there in John 3, is physical, that which is spiritual is spiritual. Marvel not that I say unto you, you must be born again or born anew. Have the life of God come into you. Your spirit has to be. See, we're born physically. Now our spirits have to be born again, renewed, alive unto God through the acceptance of the work of Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Amen. So you can believe in Jesus and not confess him as Lord. It doesn't, it doesn't cut the mustard. Thank you for your enthusiasm. Okay. So death reigned over all mankind. Adam, was the, Adam calls death to pass on to all mankind. Uh, he was not allowed to partake of the tree of, uh, of life. He was driven out of the garden. Um, good acts. Look at Ephesians chapter 2. Good acts can't save you. This morning, you know, we, we, have, we said we have a financial need. If you gave, gave us $25,000, I won't get you in heaven. That won't cut it. See, it's, that, that's, not, that's a good work. It's a good deed. But that's not what gets you in heaven. Hallelujah. Ephesians, the second chapter. It says down here in verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works or human works, lest any man should boast. Now, see, some people get this mixed up. They think this means that you don't ever do anything and you don't, do, you don't, you don't obey the Bible, and you don't do anything after you get saved. No, you can't get saved by doing works. But the Bible says, that, you know, right, it goes right on and right after this, it says, it's, it's not of works, lest any man should boast. Amen. Glory to God. He goes on and says right after that, for we are created, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So good, good works don't save you, but good works should be the fruit of your salvation. In other words, what you, how you live and how you live your life should be a reflection of what took place in your life when you got born again. Amen. I mean, if you, if you sat around and, 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 and shot up all the time when you get, before you got saved, when you get saved, you stop shooting up. There should be a change and you don't need to shoot. You don't need to shoot up. Unsaved or saved, you don't need it, but, you know, so w w unsaved will get you to hell quicker. It'll mess your life up. Drugs, drugs are not a help to you. Did I miss the turn off this morning? Y'all here, you gone home? All right. All right, just talk to me. Talk to me out there. Hallelujah. And so mankind, death reigned over mankind, according to Romans chapter 5. I have so many notes that I, I, I'm going to have to just kind of tell you. You have to go back and look at it, all right? Because there's no way I'm going to get close to getting through this this morning. What are the results of our redemption from spiritual death? Look at John 10.10. 10. This is where we're going to get into the, you know. We, we kind of know where we are. If you're, if you're not saved, you know where you are. Now, you may have been told that it's okay, that, you know, there's no such thing as heaven or hell. And, you know, and, and those, those crazy preachers, all they want is your money. And uh, all they care about, you know, is, is, is making a living off of making you afraid. And here's the problem. What if you're wrong and I'm right? The other side of that is, if I'm wrong and you're right, and there's nothing after death, nobody will ever know. <laughs> okay, you won't get to go, Woo, I was right, I was right, I was right. <laughs> but if I'm right and you're wrong after death, you don't want to be lifting up your eyes and torments going, he was right. Something to think about. Yeah. Hallelujah. John 10.10. 10. The thief cometh not. Right. Just in case you don't know who the thief is, it's the devil. But to steal, to kill, and to destroy, I am come that they might have life and have that, and that they might have it more abundantly. Now, the Greek word life here is zoe. You've seen it, Z-O-E, with a little uh, mark over top of the E. Life is a principle. Life in the absolute sense. Life as God has it, that which the Father has in himself, and which he gave to the incarnate Son to have in himself, and which the Son manifests in the world. In other words, the very life that is in God, Jesus came to give us. Because let me tell you something, that's what man had in the garden before the fall. Remember, if you go back and look at Genesis chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and the Bible says God formed man from the dust of the ground. And the Bible says, and he breathed into him the breath of life. Now, the Hebrew word there means spirit. It's translated spirit, wind, okay? 
So the word, the word translated wind and the word translated spirit, in Greek, the Greek word is pneuma, the Hebrew word equivalent is the same thing, means the same thing, it means spirit. God took of his spirit, but that body didn't live until God took of himself and put in it. Mm -hmm. And it became a living soul. That body did not live. It was formed, it was, it was lifeless. It laid there in the form, in the image of God. God took of himself and put in that body and it came alive. Then put him asleep, took his rib, made a woman. Hallelujah. Men say hallelujah. hallelujah. You just missed an opportunity to, to earn brownie points with your wife. <laughs> hallelujah. He said that I have come that Satan, Satan steals, kills, and destroys. Look at your life this morning. I always like to say this when I'm talking on this scripture. Take a piece of paper, make four columns. Over each column, write a word. Over one column, write steal. Over the other column, write kill, over another column right, destroy, and over the fourth right, life. Then take all the events taking place in, in, in your existence today and put them in the right column. All right? House burned down, destruction. Car broke down, stealing, you're stealing your money. You know? Dog got run over, kill. Amen? Got healed, hallelujah. Life. And when you get done, go down, go back up to the top, and write one of those little squirrely things over top of the kill, steal, and destroy, and write devil. Then over the column it says life, write God. Because Jesus said that the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. I am come that you might have life and have it in more abundance. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory to God. So if it's still and killing or destroying, God didn't do it. Well, I grew up believing that everything happens, God has a reason. Look at your Bible. Jesus said the thief kills, steals, and destroys. I came to give you life. People say, you know, God makes people sick. And those people who lay hands on people get them healed of the devil. Jesus, the Bible says in Acts 10, 38, that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. For God was with him. Read the Bible. You know, helps. Don't take grandma's word for it. I remember my grandma told me one time, she said, you need to be rooted and grounded in holiness. She meant Pentecostal holiness. She meant our church doctrine. I went and found the Bible scripture. You know what it says? We're to be rooted and grounded in love. But grandma heard that in church and she just repeated it, you know, just repeated what she heard. We need to know what the Bible says. You know, love grandma. Grandma was filled with the Holy Ghost. Grandma gave me the Pentecostal background, but, you know, we take it, we take Things that people say and don't study out for ourselves and find out the truth. We got to know what the Bible says. Jesus said, I came to give you life. See, the, part of the, the greatest part of the plan of redemption is redemption from spiritual death. Until you're born again, you cannot know the fullness of the goodness of God. Until, like Brother Hagin used to say, unless you're ready to die, you're not ready to live. And the only way you can be ready to die is to know Jesus. And when you know him, then you're ready to die. Amen. I said, amen. You know, when you, when you don't know him, you're not ready to die. You can live in the fear of death. But see, when you get born again, you don't have to fear death. You don't have to be afraid of leaving this life and going, in, going into to the kingdom of God. Hallelujah. And your loved ones will be right behind you. Glory to God. Amen. Not that far down the road. We, man, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. One of the most powerful scriptures in the Bible. Set verses 17 through 21. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passing up. One, one Bible that I read one time said this. He's a new species of being that never existed before. What? See, when you're, when, you're, when you're not born again, you're a child of the devil. When you get born again, you become a child of God. The life of God enters into you. You're born again, hallelujah, from death unto life. God's life now, that Zoe life, life of the absolute sense, that resurrection life, now is on the inside of you, and you are reconciled to the Father. You're one with the Father, glory to God. Hallelujah. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new, and all things are of God. Let me, I, I like to stop right here and always say this. When you got born again, you didn't forget your name, your address, or your telephone number. So you didn't get a new soul. And if you came to church and you were 60 pounds overweight, you left 60 pounds overweight. You didn't get a new body. But what's he talking about? He's talking about your spirit. Mm -hmm. 
your spirit is born again. Then Romans tells us to renew our mind to the Word of God. The Bible tells us we had the seal of, over in Ephesians that we had the seal of redemption on our bodies. So what happens at the new birth? Old things pass away, all things become new. Your old spiritual nature. Now, I, I used to hear this growing up in my church. You know, that's my old nature. Well, you know, uh, it may be the flesh, but it's not my old nature. My nature got trans uh, killed and crucified, and I was born again. The life of God entered into me. I renew my mind to the Word of God. I've saved my soul, my suke, my pneuma, my spirit gets born again. It becomes alive unto God. I'm a child of God. I'm reconciled to the Father. I'm one with God. How can we be one with God? Well, Jesus said he prayed that we, that we be one with him as he is with the Father. Jesus prayed that. I and them, them and me. Hallelujah. We're one with God. We're, well, we're born of a spirit. But your head can be messed up. How many of you ever had a messed up head? You need to check up from the neck up. Your carnal thinking. Well, what do you do? Romans says to renew it to the word of God. Amen. Word of, word of, James says receive with meekness the engrafted word of God. Notice what it says. Which is able to save your soul. Not your pneuma, your suke. See, when you get born again, you get born again. Your spirit gets alive unto God. The soul, the mind, your thinking processes, and all those things need to be renewed with God's word over time. But, and then your body, you got to keep it under. Paul said, I keep my body under. I buffet my body. I keep it under. Why? Because you, you don't have and you will not get a new body until Jesus comes back. So you have to keep it under. Paul wrote to the church at Rome in chapter 12 and said that he, that he offers his body a living sacrifice unto God, which is his spiritual service. Reasonable King James, spiritual Greek. You just got to keep, you got to tell your body no. That's, that's just it. You have to tell it no. You have to discipline your body. So when Paul says here in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, that, you know, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature, and that's your body, wouldn't that be great? We all come to the altar and go out looking like Schwarzenegger or, you know, whatever. <laughs> I'll be back. Anyway. <laughs> I amaze myself sometimes. Anyway, Janie came in last night and had on some earrings. And she said, what do you think about my earrings? I said, I like them, honey. Gypsies, tramps, and thieves. <laughs> I just messing on her. They weren't really trash looking, but I just decided to mess on her. She went, she went down and told all the kids I was messing on her. Hallelujah. Now, see, we don't, we don't get a new body. You don't get a new mind. Can you imagine? We have to, when people come up to get saved, we have to take the driver's license and say, now, where do you live? What's your name? Because when you get saved, you're not going to remember anything. We're going to have to you know, take you back where you started from. No, the spirit of man, the, the, the real part of man that, is, that exists forever gets born again. He's what's, what the life of God enters into. Hallelujah. And so you're no longer spiritually dead or spiritually separated than God. The Bible says that, that Jesus made a way where he reconciled us. He broke down the wall of partition between us and made us a, a, a one new man. Glory to God. We're reconciled to God through the new birth. Let me say this. You can't ask God to forgive you of all your sins because you can't remember them all. I'm sure my brother has done something I don't know about. Come back next week, I'll use you for preaching fodder again. <laughs> you know, you see, one time in 30 years, you've got, you got to get all your shots in. Remember the brother that had the Bible upside down? <laughs> Praying that Jesus would heal the wall before mom and daddy got home? Although it was my foot, he was praying. Of course, our big brother was down the street. Mom and daddy, mom and daddy, mom and daddy. If he was here, I'd tell him, him too. <laughs> they put a hole in the wall. We had terrazzo floors in Florida. We used to take the rugs and skim them across the floor, hit the bed and flip, and I put my foot right through the sheetrock. <laughs> it wouldn't have been so bad if mom and dad hadn't told us a thousand times not to do that. So Frank went down the street to the neighbor's house where my mom and dad were. said, they got a hole in the wall. They got a hole in the wall. They got back. By the time they got back, we had the Bible out, the big family Bible. First one we could get our hands on. We were praying, oh, Jesus, heal that wall. Jesus, heal that wall. Ty's sitting there. He's a little fella. He's got it upside down reading the Bible. I think it was some picture of Jesus. He's upside down. Anyway, and they came and they heard us, they heard us pray and saw the Bible upside down. My older brother was so disappointed they just couldn't do anything to us. 
<laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. Well, I just thought I'd tell that story. You know, if any man is in Christ, his spirit gets born again. He's a new creature. All things pass away. All things become new. What? Your spirit's now alive unto God. Hallelujah. The, the life of God now abides in you, and you are now one with the Father, and you have access to heaven. You die, you go to heaven. Glory to God. I'm, I'm, it's good to be ready to go to heaven. Now, listen, we don't have to wait to get to heaven to enjoy it. Deuteronomy says we can have days of heaven on the earth. But Jesus came to redeem us from spiritual death. Number one, redeem us from spiritual death. That was his number one thing. There's all kinds of good things after that. But the first thing is, get you redeemed from spiritual death. You must be born again. <clears throat> Going to church, like I said, paying off all the church debt, you know, taking little old ladies out on their excursions, having your CDL license, riding the old ladies to the Biltmore, all those, are, that's not going to get you in heaven. It is a personal relationship with God the Father through Jesus Christ. You must be born again. No way around it. Hallelujah. Then he goes on and says here, um, All things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and given unto us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, King James, for to know that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then... We, that is the believer, are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. Here's, what, here's the prayer of Paul to, the, to people. Be reconciled to God. Verse 21. For he hath made, now, now, if you've got a King James Bible, the words to be are italicized. That means it was not in the Greek, added by the translators, for the purpose of making it easier to read or to flow better when reading. But I like to leave it out because it's not there. It's just not there in the Greek, so, you know, King James, and they got italicized to let you know it wasn't there. So I'm not changing the Bible by not reading it. If it's not there and they added it, I'm not going to read what they added. So it reads this way. He has made him sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Here's the greatest miracle of redemption is identification. Jesus identified with us in our state of fallen humanity. Received the judgment of God that humanity was to receive. Was raised from the dead for our justification. And then made available to all that believe in him the life and the absence of penalty. Because he's already borne the penalty. Remember, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Being made a curse for us. For it's written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. And that was written before crucifixion. It's a, it's a quote of a prophecy. Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. Jesus identified with us in our lost state. He became what we were. So we, keep, we could become what he is. Now, when I say that, we're not the son of God. But we are or become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Paul said that, not Pastor Ed. Paul said that. By inspiration of the Holy Ghost, Paul said that. Paul said, Jesus identified with us in our sin so that we can identify with him in his resurrection. Now, you have to identify with him in his resurrection before we leave the body, leave the earth. That's, that's your window. All right? Your window is, the window's open as long as you're breathing. Once that stops, that's why the Bible says, do not harden your heart. Book of Hebrews chapter 10. Do not harden your heart as the Israelites did in the day of provocation. Amen. For today is the day of salvation. Glory to God. You have, we, we each, every person alive on the planet. And this is one of the big things, that the, the big crusade coming up here in September. Reinhard Bonnke, um, if you've never heard of him, 72 million Africans gave their heart to Jesus over his ministry in Africa. 45 million in the last 10 years. That's why Africa has churches that one of the churches in, 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 in Lagos, um, they, it's, it's a half, it's, it's a mile wide or a half mile wide? Mile and a half wide. It's a mile wide and a half mile deep. It's a mile wide and a half mile deep. And it's just shelters put together. Yeah. Pastor Hagen went over three years ago and they had under roof two million people. Their estimates, they won't publicize this because they, they say, well, some people say you can't prove it, but their estimates Unofficial estimates. So they call it the unofficial because they don't want people thinking they're trying to exaggerate. Their unofficial estimates are between three and a half and five million people were there for that service. 
Well, what happens in, in, in a continent when 45 million people get saved in 10 years? Reinhard Bunke is coming to Greensboro because he said America shall be saved. We, we become a secular, pluralistic, secular society. A friend of ours, Janet Brzee, was at the Woodland Hills Mall in Tulsa the other day, and there was a Muslim out praying on his prayer mat in the middle of the mall on his lunch break. Now, they asked if they could do a flash mob Christmas carol, and they wouldn't let them do it. Christians can't do stuff. Muslims can. Let me tell you, Jesus... Harrison Ford's not going to get on the horse and ride. They all bow down to him. Raiders of the Lost Ark, the white horse. Did you get the symbolism? It was all about Muhammad. Jesus is the one that's coming back. Jesus is already raised from the dead. America shall be saved. And we have to, we got to be strong about telling people that they must be born again. You need Jesus Christ. You're lost without hope, without God in this world. You may be, you know, you can enjoy life. You can enjoy stuff. You can do all kinds of things, you know, and, and, and look and have fun. The Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a season. And if that season runs right up to the time you draw your last breath, fun dies. This is not the Hotel California. Oh, oh God. Stop. <clears throat> Some of y'all remember the old album jacket. Alexander Crowley up on the balcony. You know, the, the professed Satanist. The little 666 on his forehead. He said, I don't believe it. I had the album. Threw it away when I got saved. But there he was. You know, Hotel California was you could check in, but you couldn't check out. I remember Led Zeppelin. Stairway to heaven. See, Satanists believe there's a back stairway into heaven out of hell. They're going to go party hardy, and then after a certain amount of time, they get to go to heaven. No, 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 no. You have to confess Jesus as Lord in this life. Jesus came to make a way where there was no way. And the thing is, he made it so simple. You don't have to go earn your salvation. I mean, what, what, what would it be bad for saved? You've got to give $50,000 to the church to get saved. I guess we're all going to hell in here. Hello? If you, don't, if you don't leave your complete dowry to the church, we're not going to do last rites over you. guess we're going to hell. No. He made it so simple. Run, turn to Romans chapter 10. He made it so simple. Look down and I'll read verse 1, start at verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Now, Paul was a Jew, sent to the Gentiles. For I bear them record. They have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. Now, let me say this. You can be truly seeking after God, but if you do not seek after God and you are ignorant in your pursuit, you are not pursuing it after God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of right, the law of righteousness to everyone that believeth. Moses described the righteousness, which is of the law, that the man which doeth those things shall live by them. But the righteousness, which is of faith, speaks this way. Say not in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall ascend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead? But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, in thy mouth and in thy heart, that is, the word of faith which we preach. Here it is, folks. Now, God made it so simple. I, 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 I won't stop. You know, Brother Hagin told one woman, she came and said, Brother Hagin, I want to get saved, but I, I can't. He said, why? She said, well, she said, well, I love to dance, you know, social dancing, and I don't want to quit dancing. Now, that really takes on a different connotation today, doesn't it? Back then, it's probably ballroom dance, and now it's, you know, drop it like it's hot or something, you know? And of course, that's old news now. They're twerking or something. They got all kinds of stuff they're doing. Lord Jesus. Yeah, all kinds of stuff. He said, go ahead, get saved, you can dance all you want to. About two weeks later, she came back to church. She said, I understand now. And she said, what? He said, what? She said, I don't want to dance anymore. The want to is gone. See, when you get born again, when you, give your life, when you give your life to Jesus and give it over to him full heartedly, you want to honor him and please him in everything you do. Now, not, not that, you know, like, you know, like when Jesse gets married, we're going to have a father-daughter dance. It won't be twerking. Thank you, Jesus. Yeah. Okay? And it won't be dropping it like it's hot. It will be with, with decorum and, and as much as I can without tripping over a dress. Anyway. Verse 8. What saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth, and thy heart, the word of faith which we preach. Here's how easy it is. 
If you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, King James says the Lord Jesus, the margin says Jesus is Lord. And believe in your heart God's raising from the dead, you will be saved. For with the mouth, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made into salvation. For the scriptures say, who believes on him shall not be ashamed. Jesus came and went to the cross and was paid the price for our sin, was raised from the dead to make salvation. Let me understand this. When I say this, don't, don't misinterpret it. But he came to make salvation easy. You do not have to do penance in the church. Martin Luther was climbing up the, the steps of the basilica on his knees, bleeding, when he heard the voice of the Holy Spirit say to him, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. He got up from that place and went and wrote his, uh, t what, what, his theses, 100, 10,000, whatever it was, 99, 97, 99 theses, whatever it was, I forget now. Went and nailed it to the church door, church with a knife, and was considered a heretic. If you look, if you can find you an old Bible from the church at Rome, in the back you find Martin Luther says heretic. Because he was his, he said the just shall live by faith. Now he got into extreme because he said, I don't believe a man can commit 10,000 fornications and not lose his salvation. So he went off the deep end. But you got to understand, he swore to depend on so far the other way because of what he was coming out of. They thought they could earn their salvation, getting born again by doing all these works. He was bleeding, trying to do enough penance for the forgiveness of, of his sin. Jesus has already bought the forgiveness of your sin. Jesus has already paid the price. Jesus nailed it to the cross. Colossians says he took it and nailed it to the cross, took it out of the way and nailed it to his cross. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. And so we come to God. You come repentant. Recognizing your loss without God, you confess Him as your Lord because you want to give your life over to Him. Now, you know, some people say that, you know, uh, repent, repent means just to change your mind. It means to change your mind and have actions that correspond with it. Look in your Bible. Everywhere they repented, they changed how they acted. They didn't keep living the same way. Things were different. See, when you're born again, you, you, you do things different. Amen. You get born again, you stop smoking dope. Well, I think smoking dope's all right. You know, it's a herb. Give me a break. Why don't you say, you know, well, heroin comes from an opium plant. Yeah, it's, 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 it's poppy seeds. It comes out of those poppy seed things. You know, if you, if, you if you eat a bunch of poppy seeds and go in for a drug test, you'll test positive for opiates. Yeah. So if you're, if you're placed drug test, you don't eat, you know, poppy seed buns at lunch. Because you can test positive for opiates. <laughs> just saying, you know. Well, just because, you know, we like poppy seeds on our buns don't need, 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 mean you need to shoot up and, and start shooting up because it's, it's natural in the earth or something. When you get born again, you live different. But that's because God's life is on the inside of you. You have a different view of life. I remember when I first got saved. Now, I, I, I grew up in my church, but I didn't get saved until... July 11th, 1979, at First Pentecostal Holiness Church at the corner of Brinkley Road and Plaza Drive, about 7.45 p.m. on a Wednesday night. Hallelujah. Brother Gentry was out of town, and they had Brother uh, Leroy, Leroy something, I forgot his last name now, preaching. I don't even know what he said that night. I, don't know, I still, to this day, don't know what he preached. I do remember him saying, come on down front, and I went down there and got saved. How did you get saved? You gave, you, I confessed Jesus as my Lord. Believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. I gave my life over to him. Have you failed since then? Yep. But thanks be to God. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Glory to God. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. But the first step is you've got to enter into the kingdom. And Jesus paid the price. You can't earn it. Hello? If I got, if, you know, one woman a number of years ago was in a church in, in a uh, she came in the church and she had been gotten filled with the Holy Ghost, spoken tongues by 30 or 40 minutes. One of the elders came and sat down beside her and said, Sister, if you take that gold ring off your finger, God will fill you with the Holy Ghost. Brother Hagin said, Too late! Done been filled. Ring and all. Billy Graham's crusade is always in with just as I am, without one plea. So you come to God like you are. He does the cleaning. Amen? You know, see, how many of you ever gone deep sea fishing? We, we, a few years ago, we went down to Myrtle Beach. We went out. Nathan and me, and, and we caught some fish, caught some sea bass. They, they love the sea bass. And, uh, you know, we caught them, took them back in. They cleaned them at so much per pound. Anyway, yeah. here's what it is. I'm fishing, but God does the cleaning. 
you can't get clean enough. You can't give up enough. You can't, you know, well, I'm going to get saved, but I got to stop doing this first. No, no, you need to get saved so you can stop doing such and such. You don't have the power to stop. It's the cleaning that God does in you when you're born again and become a new creature in Christ that empowers you to live a life above. You can't fix it. So we always kind of think, well, I, you know, if I, if I stop, stop drinking a keg a weekend, you need Jesus. If you're drinking a keg a weekend, you need him real bad. <laughs> Hello? If you're dreaming life, is either get a kegerator. You all know what that is? It's a refrigerator. You put the keg in, got the thing on the top, you know. That's your dreaming life. You need Jesus. You know? People talk about, you know, well, my, my boyfriend drinks six, six beers a night on the weekend. He drinks 36 on the weekend. Can you imagine if we went to a party and I sat down and drank 36 Cokes while we were sitting around talking and watching a ball game? You think something's wrong? I'm a sugar addict or something. Yeah. People drink beer like crazy. You know? And you know what? It's to hide. Really, it's to hide the emptiness that's way down inside of your spirit and you don't even recognize it. There's an emptiness that only Jesus Christ can feel by reconciling you to the Father. And he's already made the way. He's already made the plan. He's already done everything that can be done except you have to accept it and walk in the light of it. Mm -hmm.